At the turn of the last century, the 1900s, the world was changing rapidly as the Industrial Revolution was reshaping the labor market, and as a result, among other grievances, there were mass riots in which hundreds were killed and billions in damages incurred. As a governmental response, multiple resolutions were introduced, such as marking Labor Day as a national holiday, stronger worker bargaining rights, and implementing a universal high school system to better educate and give the populace the skills required for the new labor market. Translating to present day, we are now entering an age of super-intelligent computers that can take any complex data set, every legal precedent, radiology film, asset price, financial transaction, a curl table, Facebook like, customer review, resume bullet, facial expression, and so on, synthesize it, and then perform tasks and make decisions in ways that are as good as or better than the smartest human in the vast majority of cases. This process of automation and digitization, and thereby change in the labor market according to firms such as McKinsey, at a conservative estimate, will happen at a rate three to four times as fast as the Industrial Revolution, and by that metric, we can expect to see a proportional amount of civil unrest, violence, etc. While we have discussed some solutions to this automation conundrum, such as retraining or taking up work in the gig economy and platform co-ops, these are more like temporary short-term solutions, an asymmetrical response to the scale of change society will undergo. Luckily, a more permanent, long-term solution does exist. Universal Basic Income This video is brought to you by our startup Earth One and our latest product that we've put a lot of hard work and love into, a connected plant monitor. Additionally, consider joining our YouTube membership to support the production of more high-quality content. It is not a discussion of the technological revolution and automation without mentioning universal basic income, and for good reason, as in our and many others' opinion, it is one of the best potential solutions to the automation conundrum. In the simplest terms, UBI is about giving every member of society enough money to cover, as the name implies, the basics in life. This is not a new concept, with the idea of a state-run basic income going as far back as the 16th century in Sir Thomas More's book Utopia, which depicted a society in which every person receives a guaranteed income and is relieved of the burden of their essential needs. For what greater wealth can there be than cheerfulness, peace of mind, and freedom from anxiety? Moving forward a few centuries, what we now know as UBI has been championed from a diverse group of individuals of every profession, race, and political stance. From Martin Luther King Jr., Thomas Paine, Milton Friedman, Richard Nixon, Stephen Hawking, Alan Watts, the Pope, we can go on and on. The premise of a UBI has also inspired policy, with economist Milton Friedman's negative income tax. He held that the NIT would raise a poverty floor without negatively affecting the price system and market mechanisms. This would then go on to inspire the earned income tax credit from the Nixon administration in the 1970s, essentially a tax credit benefiting individuals who are earning a low or moderate income the most. After a relatively dormant few decades, it has only been since recently, 2015, where the UBI discussion has been picking up steam again, as it started to become a prominent talking point amongst technologists, such as many of those working in Silicon Valley and other tech hubs. This makes intuitive sense, as deep learning was starting to make rapid strides forward around this time period, and many in the industry were extrapolating forward and beginning to realize the long-term impacts in terms of automation, which then led tech CEOs such as Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, and Bill Gates to talk about UBI, thereby raising public awareness. Beyond awareness, in our opinion, when UBI's a policy really began to spread through the mainstream consciousness was during the presidential run of Andrew Yang. While he did go on to lose that race, Yang and his team truly understood the impacts of automation and broke it down in a concise and easy to understand way for the general public, while also highlighting the need for a UBI, or as they called it, the freedom dividend of $1,000 a month, translating to $12,000 a year, just around the US poverty line. With the origins of universal basic income understood, we can see that UBI has taken on a few distinct forms in different historical and geographical contexts. However, the core defining characteristics of it always remain the same. 1. A UBI is periodic, in other words, a recurring payment, for instance, every month as opposed to a one-off grant. 2. A UBI is paid in cash, allowing recipients to convert their benefits into whatever they would like. 3. A UBI is paid per individual person versus per household based. And 4. A UBI is truly universal and unconditional, paid to every member of society, and not targeted to a specific population. A universal basic income following these core principles intuitively makes sense. When you're a shareholder for a profitable company, you expect a dividend. And likewise, as citizens of countries with GDPs worth trillions, which are only set to increase as automation increases societal productivity, a UBI can be considered a dividend of this productivity to the populace. A UBI would also value much work today that, while important, society doesn't monetarily value. For instance, stay-at-home parents and caretakers. People in these roles work just as hard if not harder than those in typical full-time roles and are needed for society to function. However, they are not currently monetarily compensated for their work. 
In the age of automation, as more jobs are lost to technological change and as society gets more productive, no one should have the burden of worry about covering basic living expenses such as rent, food, electricity, internet, and so on. While this all sounds great in theory, the benefits of a UBI can also be backed up through real-world testing. Since the 1900s, there have been many pilot tests for a UBI, from the United States, Canada, Kenya, Finland, and India to list a few. And these tests are only increasing in frequency as more countries, private entities, and nonprofits are entering the space. From the tests that have already been completed, many come to the same conclusion, that a UBI boosted recipient's mental, physical, and financial well-being, decreased the consumption of vices such as tobacco and alcohol, and led to modest improvements in employment. To give more concrete results, in Ontario, Canada's UBI pilot project of 4,000 subjects over the course of 17 months with a $1,000 basic income, 79% of subjects reported better physical and 83% better mental well-being, 50% reported a decrease in drug use, and while 17% did leave employment once basic income payments commenced, most significantly, nearly half of those subjects who stopped working during the pilot program returned to school or university to upskill for future employment. It is worth noting, many argue the less than expected increases and sometimes decreases in employment are due to the efficacy of these tests. In Ontario's case, the decrease could be attributable to conditions about non-trial earned income, in which basic income payments would be reduced by 50 cents for every dollar of earned income. Efficacy issues of other trials include, but are not limited to, small sample sizes, short time frames, and too low of an amount of monthly payments to actually provide the stability of a real UBI. Speaking of payments, this is one of the largest reasons a widespread UBI hasn't taken off in the decades it has been in discussion. There are valid concerns on how to fund an initiative of its scale. Using the USA as an example, and assuming a $1,000 UBI, that would be on the order of 2 to $3 trillion a year. Do we dare utter the dreaded T word as a solution? Whenever there is talk of taxes, it comes with many interesting connotations. In terms of a robot or automation tax, it is an even more contentious topic, as many believe it is disincentivizing innovation. However, the argument of a robot tax is not to prevent innovation, but slightly slow down the speed of automation adoption as we figure out how to transition into this new economy. In fact, currently there exists incentivization in the exact opposite direction. A business that pays a worker $100 pays $30 in taxes, but a business that spends $100 on equipment such as robotics pays only $3 dollars in taxes. The 2017 Taxes, Cuts, and Jobs Act lower taxes on purchases so much that you can actually make money buying equipment. In other words, the USA in some ways is paying companies to automate. By introducing a robot tax, we can even the playing field so to speak, so that we can more gracefully transition into an automated society. There could even be an incentivization to retrain or upskill employees by introducing tax credits on the robot tax. This tax could also slow down or prevent what we like to call toxic automation, in which a company's sole purpose is to automate as rapidly as possible without any regard for its employees, what is commonly seen in many gig employment companies such as Uber, in which they are not only paying below a fair market wage, but also use those excess profits to fund autonomous vehicle initiatives, with the goal to replace those very same workers. In addition to the robot tax, there are many other methods of taxation and talks as well on the technology sphere, which can help curb or rein in companies on the more unethical end of the spectrum and give back to society what they have taken. For instance, the data tax or data dividend as it is often called. Data is often referred to as a new oil due to how valuable it is, especially for deep learning algorithms. It is also one of the progress traps of the information age, as it could be used to build better, smarter applications, but often at the trade-off of our privacy. While this is a topic for another video, the key takeaway is that our data is worth billions. The data brokerage industry alone is estimated to be worth nearly half a trillion dollars, with near 50% of the revenue coming directly from selling consumer data. And these numbers don't even take into account companies made to solely profit off our data such as Facebook, which made $86 billion in 2020. Taxing for storing excessive quantities of data, transference fees of sending data between different brokers, or a host of other methods could be another way to collect revenue from companies who are benefiting from our data, and in many cases using it to automate away jobs. The robot and data tax are two potential policies that can ensure increased production due to automation and technological change is not just captured by a select few at the top, but rather is spread across society by funding a universal basic income. Furthermore, to the aforementioned sources, funding from a UBI can come from various other tax or budget adjustments, which in many cases is dependent on the values of the society implementing a basic income. For instance, funding could come from a value-added tax, VAT, which some nations already have, reducing the defense budget, a wealth tax, inheritance taxes, fees on financial derivatives contracts, and so on. Beyond taxes, another substantial funding source was best stated by Milton Friedman about the negative income tax, but also applies to UBI. That being, a UBI would reduce a paternalistic and intrusive state bureaucracy required to decide who among the poor merits assistance. 
As you can see, by removing the excessive amounts of bureaucracy in our current aid system about who and how they receive aid, tens to hundreds of billions of dollars could be saved that could go straight into funding a universal basic income. A UBI as opposed to welfare programs would additionally end up motivating individuals on these systems to pursue other job opportunities, volunteer work, etc. With welfare as it presently is, each program comes with its own set of stipulations to receive money. Take as an example disability income. If you break those conditions by say getting a part-time job or freelance work, you can end up making less money than if you had just stayed on welfare. As the name implies, with a UBI, it is universal, meaning there are no stipulations, and an individual will not be penalized for looking to earn extra income. To transition gracefully from our current welfare system, many have suggested making a UBI opt-in, in which case you would forgo any welfare program you are currently enrolled in. While the funding sources we have discussed thus far would work in making a UBI economically viable, there is a much simpler option. Quantitative easing, or put more simply, money printer, go bird. Now on a more serious note, whenever money printing is brought up, it does bring with it inflation fears. However, automation by its very nature is deflationary, so if we QE proportional to the jobs automation displaces to fund a UBI, these forces could balance out. To add to this, this pandemic has shown that governments around the world have the ability to print trillions of dollars when push comes to shove. Unfortunately, much of this money has gone directly to corporations, with what was told to us is that it would trickle down throughout the economy. In reality, this money has only gone into inflating asset prices and the coffers of executives and shareholders, thereby widening the wealth gap and increasing societal inequality. If instead this money was provided to the general populace, rather than a wealth ceiling, it could serve as a floor for the new economy. With people no longer burdened by their basic needs, they could afford that car repair they've needed, daycare, little league sports, and so on. Put another way, money provided by UBI actually trickles up through society, benefiting people who need it the most. There is real world data to back this claim up. Referring back to Ontario's UBI pilot project, there was an uptick in economic activity, with individuals paying for education and student loans, purchasing new eyeglasses, paying for transportation costs such as bus fares to work rather than walking, purchasing necessary items like fresh produce, hospital parking passes, winter clothes they couldn't previously afford, and so on. One couple even used the money to keep their business afloat. Furthermore, an IPS study supports this take, in which for every $1 given to high income earners results in 39 cents added back to the economy, whereas for every $1 given to wage earners, it results in $1.21 added to the economy. In economics, this is referred to as a multiplier effect. Another area we would see this multiplier effect would be in an increase in entrepreneurship. Currently, entrepreneurship is not as prevalent because the last thing someone who is struggling to pay for basic living expenses thinks is I'm going to start a business or a non-profit. What is more common is that once one acquires financial security and thereby more risk-taking capacity, they can start a business. With the safety net provided by a well-designed UBI, more organizations could come about, with some focused on tackling global problems and others focused on the local community and hiring people, thereby spurring economic activity and generating wealth. While on the subject of wealth generation, an important note to make here is that we have been looking at implementing a UBI from a purely capitalistic, GDP-oriented perspective, when in actuality, we need to re-envision this economic structure entirely for the technological revolution. This new economic structure and its impact on the future of work is what we will discuss in the next video in this technological revolution series. At this point, the video has concluded. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch it. If you enjoyed it, consider supporting us on YouTube membership to keep this brand growing. And if you have any topic suggestions, please leave them in the comments below. Consider subscribing for more content and check out our website and parent company Earth One for sustainable living made simple. This has been Encore, you've been watching Futurology, and we'll see you again soon.